Good morning, everyone. Today is Wednesday, October the 16th, and welcome to the Grand Rounds presentation. Our faculty host this morning is Dr. Anna Prismant, and I will let her introduce our guest. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kenan Walker. And yeah, it's a, thank you, Kenan, for coming here. Yeah, so Dr. Walker is a tenure track investigator in the National Institute of Aging Intramural Research Program. His research program focuses on understanding the role of abnormal immune function and inflammation in Alzheimer's disease and late life cognitive decline. He uses proteomic genetic and multimodal neuroimaging methods applied to large longitudinal cohort studies to understand disease biology and identify novel targets and biomarkers. Other areas of research include understanding the mechanisms leading to cognitive decline following major infection and evaluating the role of vascular risk factors and physical frailty in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So without further ado, yes, so Kenan, you're welcome to start the presentation. Okay, so thank you, Dr. President, and I appreciate the, the invitation to, to speak to you all, and thanks, thanks everyone for sharing part of their Wednesday morning with me. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk about, you know, how we've really used plasma proteomics to understand dementia, both from a mechanistic perspective and in terms of improving diagnostic accuracy. <laughs> so let's go for it. Um, here are my disclosures and educational objectives just quickly. So I know this is a pretty broad audience, so we'll start broadly just laying the foundation. <clears throat> I know many of you are probably familiar with Alzheimer's disease, but just so we're all on the same page, you know, Alzheimer's disease is one of multiple forms of dementia. Um, it, you know, think of it as an etiology, um, and it makes up about two thirds of all dementia cases globally, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80% and affects over 10% of people over age 65. So what do we mean when we say Alzheimer's disease? Well, technically, it's defined by the, uh, the presence of amyloid beta plaques and these tau neurofibrillary tangles um, that are intracellular plaques being extracellular. And then there's other processes going on concurrently. Uh, one of the, the key ones is this microglial activation or this neuroimmune response that you know is thought to be protective and in some cases harmful. But you know, as we learn more and more about Alzheimer's disease, the, the clear heterogeneity complexity of the disease process extending well beyond amyloid and tau becomes more apparent. So I, I put this slide here in the beginning because I want to emphasize that, you know, anywhere from 30 to 40% of the attributable risk for Alzheimer's dementia or dementia more broadly is, is thought to be due to factors that occur outside the central nervous system, factors that are potentially modifiable, you know, things like diabetes, hypertension, so there are cardiometabolic conditions, systemic inflammation, autoimmune conditions. Many of these factors, you know, that were very, you know, have been very well characterized are now known through epidemiological work to uh, lead to the increased dementia risk, increased Alzheimer's risk and specifically. And it's it's our lab's hypothesis that there's actually, you know, in between these disease risk factors and the expression of dementia risk are a set of signaling proteins, proteins in blood that really mediate this relationship between systemic health and dementia. <clears throat> so the, the framework uh, is up top. Let me just get the laser pointer out. Okay, so the idea is that you know, whether it be clinical disease, you know, like diabetes or some autoimmune condition or subclinical disease that just, you know, hasn't been diagnosed yet, but is still there, or an age-related process like cellular senescence, you know, what these all have in common is they, among other things, can influence the, the proteome. So that's the expression of proteins across various organ systems, across various cell types. And these proteins, many of them are secreted and find their way into the bloodstream. So, so our hypothesis is these proteins can interact with target cells within the brain, you know, neurons, astrocytes, microglia, et cetera, through various conduits. And I list some of the conduits here. You know, this includes bovine barrier, endothelial activation, et cetera. I'll talk about these more in a little detail uh, later in the talk. But some of these um, inflammatory proteins 
or, or these proteins that influence target cells within the brain have been identified. Many of them are cytokines, chemokines, they're increased or decreased with aging, and they're known to affect, you know, these target cells. And, and a lot of, you know, some of them are illustrated here. We hypothesize that there's many, many more proteins in circulation uh, that may be involved in dementia risk that really haven't yet been discovered that may be useful as either uh, biomarkers or potential therapeutic targets. And so to address this question and to identify some of these you know, intervening or intermediary proteins, what we've done is use large-scale proteomics you know, to identify these. And so you know, for those of you not familiar with proteomics, it's really you know, accelerated, I would say, in the past you know, five to 10 years with the advent of these uh, large-scale platforms that are sort of independent of mass spec, but it'll really allow you to measure many, many proteins with a small value volume of, of blood or CSF or, you know, whatever other biofluid. But one of the platforms is, is Somalogic, and that's the one that I'll talk about and that we've used um, most you know, frequently. But the Somalogic platform now allows you to measure up to 11,000 proteins with, you know, 100 microliters, say, uh, of, of blood, and it allows you to capture, therefore, the proteomic signature of different phenotypes, different, you know, outcomes. And we, of course, apply this to dementia risk. Now, I'll talk, what I'm going to talk about is using an earlier version of the platform, which you know still allowed you to capture about 5,000 different proteins. But um, you know, sometimes I'll talk about 7,000 on a later version. We don't, we haven't used the 11,000 protein platform yet, but it is out there for those interested. So one of the first things we did is apply this proteomic platform to look at future dementia risk, incident Alzheimer's disease. Well, sorry, incident all-cause dementia. So we're not focusing on Alzheimer's disease specifically here. But what we did was we we found, when we ran this analysis, and this was published in 2021 in Nature Aging, we found a number of proteins, you know, previously not identified that predicted five-year incident dementia risk. And, you know, within this group were a few proteins that we identified as potentially causal based on uh, some methods that I'll describe later. That, you know, so we, you know, all in all, we identified a few novel biomarkers, but also some potential therapeutic targets that we think are mechanistically relevant. Now, this first study was done in older adults. This was done in people who are 75 years of age, at least on average. And, and I would say many of the studies that came out around the same time had used similar cohorts of similar ages. But we know that Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia really begins much earlier than late life. Right. There's this protracted preclinical period that takes place across multiple decades uh, before people express symptoms. So, you know, the idea is that, you know, the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, the pathogenesis of vascular dementia, and probably other forms of neurodegenerative disease starts much, much earlier than when people express symptoms. And it happens to sort of at least, at least conventional thought is that this begins really in, in middle age. So we thought, okay, if we're going to understand the proteomic signature of future dementia risk, we really need to look, you know, at middle-aged adults. And so this is this is exactly what we did. We were fortunate enough to, to have access to a sample of, of people, and I'll talk about the cohort now, that, um, you know, had blood and long-term dement dementia follow-up, you know, in subsequent years. So using data from the atherosclerosis risk in communities cohort, and, you know, this is this multi-site community-based study, I, you know, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, one of the sites is actually here in, in Minnesota. And yeah, so this cohort really was started in late 1980s and is still ongoing. And initially it enrolled 16,000 individuals and they've been followed since then. So we used blood taken from visit three, which occurred in 1993 to 95, to, to apply this proteomic platform and measure 5,000 proteins. And then we related each of these 5,000 proteins to dementia risk over the subsequent 25 years. Now, in that time, we had about 2,000 incidents so new onset dementia cases. And at the time we measured the, um, the, the plasma proteins, people were 60 years of age on average, uh, but really spanned between 40, I would say, to, to 75 so when we did was we looked at proteins in relation to dementia across 25 years. We, we did a near-term follow-up, which is dementia 
you know, from midlife out to 15 years, and then a long-term follow-up, which was dementia uh, after 15 years. So look at different like time periods to see if proteins, the proteins predicted dementia risk in you know certain epochs of follow-up differed. But when we ran our full follow-up and our full-term follow-up analysis um, on the whole sample here, we found about 30 proteins that were associated with future dementia risk over this 25 year period, you know, after adjusting for, you know, some of the you know, well-known confounders. And this is at a bond for any correct, corrected threshold. So proteome wise significance. So it's pretty conservative thresholding here, but we're still seeing, you know, the number of proteins, you know, meet that statistical significance level. Uh, up top is GE of 15, which, um, you know, rose well above the, the others. It's known to be relevant to to aging and associated with multiple area, multiple comorbidities, mostly age related. Um, but we were struck by the, the magnitude of this uh, you know, association. And we've since done some follow-up analysis and uh, on this and I found GD15 to be a strong predictor of actually vascular dementia and much lesser so for, for Alzheimer's disease. That's, that's a different story, but I'll talk about these proteins more broadly. When we look at the full follow-up time with follow-up within 15 years and follow-up beyond 15 years, this is how, this is the breakdown of the, you know, what amounts to 32 proteins that we identified. So, you know, we see a number of them identified across full follow-up within a shorter 15-year period after this midlife protein measurement. We see about six proteins, and these are distinct from, you know, the full follow-up, which is notable. Uh, so, and these proteins, I would say, are probably more relevant to incipient or near-term dementia onset, maybe relevant later in the disease process if they are indeed mechanistic. Um, and then we, you know, when we look beyond 15 years, you know, not a whole, nothing new really, but we can say that these proteins here are are elevated or downregulated very early on. And then GDF15 is consistent across all follow-up periods, you know, just, you know, suggesting this is a really robust biomarker potentially. One thing I want to point out is that, you know, there's been an orthogonal approach or, you know, efforts to identify therapeutic targets for Alzheimer's disease, really focused on brain tissue proteomics, you know, human brain, you know, autopsy samples, and they've, you know, gone through and nominated a number of their, of targets that have a high, for which they have a high level of conviction. And we did see some overlap with, with um, their, therapeutic targets, you know, in blood of middle-aged adults, which is notable, uh, you know, this is a totally orthogonal, totally separate approach, but we are converging on some some similar um, molecular pathways. Now, I know I said the, at the point when blood was measured, people were in age 60. So it's like, okay, this, we're, this is sort of the latter part of midlife. We wanted to know if we did truly have bona fide midlife biomarkers. So we had a large enough sample that we were able to split it in half. We took people at, at the lower half of the age range, so our 40 and 50 year olds, we ran the same analysis with the same proteins to see whether or not they were you know, still associated with dementia risk. And almost all of them were. Some of them showed even stronger associations, you can see here and here um, for dementia risk when we looked at the younger half of our sample. So we do think that we have some bona fide midlife biomarkers here, or at least associations. The predictive value we'll talk about later. So what do these proteins do? Right now, they're just a bunch of, you know, I'm just showing you gene names. You may be familiar with some of them. But, you know, if we qualitatively characterize them in terms of function, you know, we see they fall into, most of them fall into one or more of, of six different categories with immune proteostasis function and synaptic function probably being the most common uh, categories for which these proteins fall into. Um, we were able to characterize biology a, a bit more quantitatively using a network-based approach. And this is in collaboration with Pascal Schlosser. Um, but what we did is we took all 5,000 proteins. So we're no longer looking at the top 30, we're looking at all 5,000. And we were able to use an approach that's very similar to WGCNA, which some of you may be familiar with, but we were able to cluster proteins based on co-expression or co essentially high correlation. And we were able to find modules or clusters of proteins among the 5,000 that were highly correlated with each other with the underlying assumption being that 
you know, if these proteins are highly correlated, maybe they're part of a similar biologic process. And, and so, you know, we moved forward with this. We were excited to see 19 modules. Um, the modules in, range in size from 20 proteins, so very small, which, you know, you see on this dendrogram, uh, you can imagine what some of the smaller ones, like this one at the end, versus a 2,000 a module that's 2,000 proteins large, which is, you know, you see here, uh, also represented in the heat map. But because we thought these modules <clears throat> were relevant to specific biologic process, we were able to take the... <clears throat> take the module itself, use it as a predictor, and relate the modules to dementia risk in the same way we related individual proteins to dementia risk. So we did we did just that same uh, covariate adjustment, you know, and here we use our FDR corrected threshold. <laughs> and we saw when we looked at the full-term follow-up, uh, three modules, module one, five, and 19 that were associated with uh, this long-term dementia risk and a, a separate module, module nine. Yes, here again, we're seeing this distinct uh, association between some proteins and modules and near-term dementia risk. But we're seeing module nine is associated with dementia within 15 years and nothing new when we look beyond 15 years, just sort of the, the same associations from the first analysis repeated. So right now, these modules are just groups of proteins. We were able to annotate them to try to understand the biology based on what proteins were sort of enriched um, or what pathways were enriched among the proteins assigned to a specific module. And these modules were mutually exclusive in terms of their proteins. But <clears throat> to spare you some of the details, we were able to, you know, look, try to capture the directionality and, you know, of course, the, the functional annotation ac across this 25-year timeline based on when we saw the module you know, being relevant to dementia risk. And this is sort of the, the picture that was assembled. So, you know, what I like to say, there's this multi-decade involving signature that's largely immune-related uh, as we get closer and closer to dementia onset. So the, the models that are associated with 25-year dementia risk seem to be down-regulated for certain immune processes like JAK's, JAK-STAT or antiviral signaling and up-regulated for other aspects of innate immunity um, like it, you know, the general immune response, but also uh, leukocyte activation. And at the same time, when we, well, in subsequent years, about 15 years closer to the 15 years before dementia onset, you see some what different pathways being enriched. You see this downregulation and coagulation and, and this dysregulation that's more prominent in complement signaling. And so the, the, the proteins associated with dementia risk do seem to evolve as we get closer to dementia onset. So, you know, one of the questions we were after was, do we have any mechanistically relevant proteins here? What's causal? What can be potentially targeted very early on to try to slow or stave off, or, you know, dare I say, prevent dementia risk? And so we, you know, we're, there's an observational study here, but we were able to try to make some, you know, firmer conclusions about causality using you know, a genetic approach, particularly to sample Mendelian randomization. And this is in collaboration with Mayo Fornage and Yunju Yang, <clears throat> pictured here. But essentially what we did was we ran a genome-wide association study on protein level to identify what are called protein quantitative trait low sire P PQTLs. These are genetic variants that are associated with you know, the level of protein in, in your blood. And we were able to use these uh, gen genetic instruments in a Mendelian randomization framework to see if the same, pro essentially the same variants that are associated with protein abundance also predicted Alzheimer's disease. And this allowed us to make some causal inferences. We also did the reverse where we looked at if the protein, you know, if the genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's disease um, were overlapped with those that predicted protein abundance. So going in the forward direction first, proteins to Alzheimer's disease, um, we did see overlap in, in the PQTLs. Um, well, essentially, we saw genetic overlap between proteins and Alzheimer's disease for two of the, the 32 identified proteins. And I, I have the Mendelian randomization framework here on the left. But the, the, the neat thing about this, for those less familiar with it, is that it allows us to circumvent some of the issues related to, you know, residual confounding and reverse causation that you know, are very central and common in, in traditional observational research. So because, you know, we're relying on this random allocation of genetic variation across individuals, 
you know, with some people being sort of, you know, having a genetic propensity to express high levels of a certain protein and others having genetic propensity to express low levels of a certain protein, you know, become sort of nature's, nature's clinical trial. And, you know, we're able to make some based on that and with a whole host of assumptions that are sort of checked by the sensitivity analysis, you know, we're able to make some causal inferences. Now, calcin calcentinin-3 was implicated, but didn't hold up, you know, in our sensitivity analysis that tested these assumptions. But serpinate 3 was the one protein that did appear causal and, you know, is protein that others have, you know, there's been some evidence for before. So it's, it's not totally out of the blue, but, you know, there hasn't been a whole lot of evidence or a whole lot of excitement around this protein, well, until now, potentially. But, um, you know, we're excited about it and think that it is potentially something that is is targetable and mechanistically relevant. And so we do plan on following that up. So we looked in the reverse direction as well. Does Alzheimer's disease actually influence protein levels? And, you know, based on the amount of red on this table, Suffice it to say that the answer is yes in a large way. Um, importantly, not for serpinate 3. So we, we're not at risk for this reverse causation, at least for the protein that we think is potentially causal or mechanistically relevant. But for a number of the proteins that we think of as biomarkers, you know, here we have evidence that the genetics underlying Alzheimer's disease can influence abundance of these proteins, you know, even in middle-aged adults. So I think of this as, you know, potential, well, one way to think of this is sort of this genetic support for the value of these proteins as biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, not necessarily specific to Alzheimer's disease, but you know, we, we have some support here you know, that also suggests that they're not necessarily causal. Um, but if we think of, okay, we have at least one causal protein, a number of biomarkers that have you know, support across cohorts, and I didn't show independent validation, but put, you know, in front of the paper, there was, you know, many of these proteins were validated independently. Um, and then we have some genetic support using our two sample Mendelian randomization. You know, I like to think that we have a, a set of midlife plasma biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and all cause dementia that represent distinct aspects of biology beyond amyloid, beyond tau, which we also have very good plasma biomarkers for at this point. But, you know, we know that the disease process itself is heterogeneous. And, you know, if we can understand the degree to which produce stasis, immune function, synaptic function, vascular and ECM uh, organization are dysfunctional ahead of dementia onset, you know, that may help us stratify people based on risk or disease etiology or subgroup, you know, individuals for very different therapeutics that, you know, can be given in addition to the anti amyloid therapies that have you know, been recently approved. So, and we have these biomarkers. Beyond that, we want to know how well we can actually predict 20 year dementia risk. Um, and so now we're talking about prediction in the like stricter sense. Do we have, can we put these proteins together to actually, you know, measure them in a 50 year old and say, okay, this is your probability of dementia within the next 20 years. And this is what risk been you're in. So we tried to do just that. And this was a, a, a I guess, you know, a collaboration between my lab and uh, Somalogic. So this was, and this is led by Claire Patterson, who's at Somalogic, and Michael Duggan, who's a postdoc in my lab. And it's currently under review, but we took the same ARID cohort, split it into 70% uh, a training set, 15% for tuning, another 15% for, for validation. And what we sought to do was identify the optimal combination of proteins measured in these middle-aged adults that is predictive of, of dementia risk in the subsequent 20 years. And so we used a machine learning approach to do that, it, you know, specifically elastic net with you know, tenfold cross-validation. But what we came up with was this 25 protein model, you know, with some overlap with the proteins I showed previously, but a lot of, you know, there's a lot of you know, distinct proteins included in this 25 protein model that optimally predicted dementia risk over subsequent 20 years. Um, and so th there were some additional modifications done to allow the score to actually lead out a, a specific probability of 20 year dementia risk. And then we, we identified four cut points so we can bend people into low risk group 
to a high risk group and then two intermediate groups, which I'll show you. So first, how well did our score perform? So in the training set, you know, we we saw an a, a um an AC or C statistic of 0.73. Okay, so yeah, it's it's not you know for those used to seeing you know case versus control or predicting dementia in people who already have it, you know, much worse than that, right? You know, it's not in that excellent category. But you know, I would say just to contextualize this, we're predicting events up to up to twenty years into the future. So I think the bar, you know, at least the threshold is different. Um, you know, given all the uncertainty about things that happen even one year into the future, you know, we're looking at twenty years. So we compare it to age, which we know is the best risk or well, strongest risk factor for dementia risk, and it underperforms age. Um, that's to be expected, given you know we have people from. 45 to 75. And obviously that's whether you're at one versus the upper or lower end of that age range is going to be the biggest determinant for future dementia risk in the subsequent 20 years. But when we combine our biggest and easy to obtain, and that's important risk factor, age with our, our dementia SOMA signal tests, and you know, that's sort of, I'll refer to our risk score as the SOMA signal test or DSST. When we combine the two, we, we get a and AUC, that's pretty respectable at 0.81 uh, for predicting events over 20 years. Okay, in the validation set, when we do proteins alone, you know, it, it holds up. So, you know, we don't think we have a bunch of overfitting or anything. Um, and, you know, it outperforms APOE, which you know, is kind of a benchmark that we at least wanted to to achieve. But um, so that's that's performance across 20-year period in our training and validation set. I think more informative is this uh, risk binning where we group people into low, uh, medium, low, medium, high, and high risk categories for 20 year dementia risk based on this, this same uh, dementia soma signal test protein based score. And this is proteins alone. For, when we look at proteins alone, the essentially the high risk group has about a tenfold or 10 times greater likelihood of developing dementia risk over a 20 year period than the low risk group. Okay, so, you know, I think the ca categorization into one of those two categories, especially, is fairly certain. And obviously, in the intermediate categories, you know, there there's some you know, well, less certainty, but they, there's still a nice sort of, um, sort of distinction that happens in a stepwise fashion. And you know, when you look at this event free probability of dementia. Now, how does the score perform against well-known you know, benchmarks now that we have, or sort of quote unquote gold standards? And I, I mentioned or alluded to this idea that you know, plasma biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease pathology, um, amyloid and PTAL specifically, have you know, there's been rapid and very exciting developments there, and they actually perform you know quite well, you know, some more than others for predicting amyloid and tau itself. And identifying people with biologically defined Alzheimer's disease. Now, they aren't necessarily designed to predict conversion to dementia, but you know, they should be. They should predict that, given that they're predictors of amyloid and tau or Alzheimer's pathology. So we compared our test, which is trained on dementia risk, to plasma biomarkers of A beta or amyloid beta, P tau one eighty one. Uh, another marker, neurofilament light, which is sort of this non-specific marker of neural injury that's you know widely used and actually an endpoint for multiple sclerosis trials at this point. And then GFAP, um, which is a marker of reactive astroglosis, which is another process that you know, you know is is clearly present in neurodegenerative disease, but not specific to Alzheimer's disease. So when we compare in a subset of our cohort. Um, our our score, our dementia soma signal test, which in this subset you know, comes in at about 0.7, as we saw in the larger validation cohort. When we compare it to amyloid beta, P tau, NFL, and GFAP, you know, it clearly does a, a, a much better job at predicting, you know, 20-year dementia risk than these, you know, than the available plasma biomarkers that are out there right now, at least as as uh, produced by the Quantarix platform. You know, the, right now, I would say P tau two seventeen is the one people are most excited about. We don't have that compared to our dementia soma signal test too, but we hope to do that in the future because I think if we outperform that, yeah, you know, it's it speaks 
it at least gives us some certainty that, okay, we, we think we have something that we can offer uh, beyond what's out there already. So um, I'll, I'll say that it even outperforms the combination of these four tests. Um, so, you know, 0.69 to 0.66. So, yeah, you know, none of them do great. <laughs> you know, to, just to be clear, none of these do great at predicting 20 year dementia risk. But, you know, our dementia soma signal test outperforms what's available. And we know when we combine it with age, we get a, a, an even larger bump and we can achieve prediction. Uh, AUC is about 0.8 which is, you know, I'd say acceptable to okay versus good. Um, okay, so how well does this do in older adults? Okay, maybe it's more relevant for our 75-year-olds. And, it, and you, know, the, you know, the upshot is it does do better in older adults, as you might expect. There's more dementia that occurs. And, it, you know, even though this, these proteins were trained in middle-aged individuals, you know, the, the risk ratio here, you know, the high group, high-risk group is at a 13-fold increased risk for dementia compared to the low risk group. So, you know, we think we can apply this dementia soma signal test across, you know, from midlife to late life. And, you know, it, it, it does seems to do even better as people get older. And it, you know, still in this older age where you expect a data PTAL and a and TFAP to, you know, actually work even better, our dementia soma signal test outperforms them at predicting dementia risk. So we took it to a few, you know, we validated this in a Japanese cohort. And, you know, actually this is, it's since been licensed to a Japanese um, health system or that, well, a Japanese company is actually using these and and it's being applied. Um, yeah, I don't know the specifics, but it, it is getting some use already. You know, we had nothing to do with that. It was kind of more of a, an industry decision. Um but it did get this external validation before its its use outside of the ERIC cohort. Now, we also validated it in other cohorts as well. We looked at it in the BLSA, the Bulk Hormone Longitudinal Study of Aging. And one thing that we did you know, was look at a number of other phenotypes. So brain volume, brain volume loss, you know, amyloid levels. So we were able to do this in the Bulk Hormone Longitudinal Study of Aging. And, you know, we saw that this, this dementia soma signal signal test score was predictive of lower brain volume and brain volume loss. And if you look in our VBM, voxel-based morphometry, you know, the, the loss of brain volume is in the medial temporal lobe where you'd expect it to be in, in the case of Alzheimer's disease specifically. Now, how to, well does it predict amyloid? Well, it wasn't trained on amyloid, but you still see this, this dementia soma signal test, you know, is higher in people who are amyloid positive and non-demented than those who are um, amyloid negative. But you know, as we might expect, amyloid itself outperforms dementia soma signal test. So it's sort of a negative control, but it still does fairly well. I think all, you know, in theory, these would be used together. The amyloid measure to predict amyloid positive status, the dementia soma signal test to predict actual clinical progression. That I think is the optimal combination for like, you know, if these were to be implemented clinically. Um, so I don't see it as a one versus the other sort of scenario. And, you know, with that, I'll just um, highlight some of the use cases. I have some, some summary up top, but, you know, one of the things, and I, you know, I don't know, I'm not advocating this go into clinical use now. This was kind of just sort of an academic exercise for us. You know, Somalogic has you know, different aspirations, but where I do see this being useful is in trial enrichment. You know, if especially for clinical trials in all disease or other forms of dementia, you know, they take a long time. They are very large because the disease progresses so slowly. Um, and for that reason, they're very, very expensive. But if we can identify people who, and before I go into that, they're actually trying to enroll people now that are, you know, before they develop symptoms. So in this preclinical period. And so the trials may have to be even longer. But if we can identify cognitively normal people that you know, have a high dementia risk based on this score and are likely to train, change or progress to dementia in subsequent years, then the idea is the trial can be quite a bit smaller and less expensive and maybe even redu reduce, you know, reduce the duration of the trial. Um, you know, in the same light, you may be able to reduce screen failures, um, you know, if, if they want to, in the trials, do subsequent screening, you know, maybe this 
blood test can be used to first stratify a high risk group to then go on sub to subsequent screening and again save money save time and then you know this is a little further out but one idea is that can be used as a proxy endpoint if your trial is not long enough or large enough to look at cognitive decline as an outcome and we know this predict this pre is a predictor of cognitive decline um you know with some more validation i'm not advocating this now but with some more validation this score could be used as a, a proxy endpoint in, to again make trials shorter in duration and cheaper so i'm going to switch gears for the last part of my talk to talk about a, a study that really looked at one aspect of dementia in particularly in particular this was looking at this idea of how infection or peripheral immune activation you know, may increase risk for dementia and you know the real objective here is to identify immune proteins that may actually or be at, at intermediaries between infection history and dementia risk so why did we look at this well you know it's clear from many lines of, of research that you know immune function is central to you know alzheimer's disease but also many forms of dementia risk so the gwas shows this quite clearly a lot of the risk variants are you know genes that are primarily expressed by you know, immune cells but you know we know that there's quite a number of risk factors that are immune related and and it's i think of them in one of two categories either these chronic immune activation risk factors things like autoimmune conditions chronic infection you know diet lifestyle or acute inflammation you know things like you know, tissue injury or surgery acute infections like pneumonia or SARS-CoV-2, you know, or critical illness, these things are known to increase risk for dementia and increase risk for Alzheimer's disease. And I highlight some of the proposed mechanisms. It, you know, the mechanisms aren't fully, fully clear, but um, we hope to elucidate that in this analysis. Okay. So, the idea is that peripheral immune challenges, whether they be these these more chronic challenges like chronic infection or acute inflammatory events like you know, you know critical illness, sepsis, for example, what they have in common is that they you know influence the proteome, particularly the, the immunoproteome, and you see this proliferation in, in you know, inflammatory proteins in particular, but a broader set of innate and adaptive immune proteins after these or in concurrently with these uh, acute or chronic inflammatory events. And these proteins, you know, make their way into the brain or at least signal the brain through various mechanisms. I referenced the conduits previously. Here we've outlined them, you know, in a little bit more detail. You know, but some of the common ones are, you know, these proteins, some of them can just be transported either diffused or with um, receptor-mediated uh, transitosis through the, the blood brain barrier itself, you know, to signal microglial astrocytes, et cetera. Um, they can also actually signal the endothelium. The endothelium gets activated and you can have a pro-inflammatory or at least some sort of signal that's uh, transmitted to the other side of, of the lumen. And, you know, you get the, the signal into the brain that way. There's also vagal nerve stimulation through cytokines, uh, by cytokines. There's also the, the idea that these cytokines through, um, you know, circumventricular organs or CDOs can actually directly signal, you know, you know, sort of the interstitial fluid in the brain. And, you know, the choroid plexus is an example of one of these, these places. So there's a whole host of areas where you can get proteins in circulation in the blood, you know, to actually influence what happens in the brain, either directly or indirectly. And the idea is that this can then influence behavior, it can influence um, you know, you know, the progression of neuropathology. You know, the, this, it's, I, I think of it like every time you catch a cold and you have a fever and you, you start you know, eating less, you start becoming more apathetic. This is just an example of these, these circulating cytokines influencing the brain. So this is something I think we all have personal experience with, but it happens in many, many times larger magnitude in these um, at least acute inflammatory events that I'm going to focus on. So there's quite a bit of evidence linking these acute inflammatory events in particular to, to in 
increased risk for dementia, cognitive decline, but also you know, these inner phenotypes like brain volume loss. So, you know, here are just some publications. Um, you know, one recent one that I'll highlight was um, published by Ryan Demmer you know, in the ERIC cohort. And I know I highlight this because I know Ryan, um, you know, was at University of Minnesota. I, I heard this morning that he recently left. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, this was a really cool paper where we showed that dementia risk was elevated quite a bit in those with a history of infection. And um, it really didn't matter where the infection was or what type of infection it was. So there's been other studies which support this as well. Some very recent large ones that I'll highlight. And this is a, one of those. This was done in about half a million people in the UK Biobank. And then it was subsequently validated in a Finnish cohort. But um, what they found was, again, irrespective of the type of infection, whether it was bacterial, whether it was viral, having a history of infection, you know, was associated with an increase in all-cause dementia uh, and an increase in etiology-specific dementia, primarily actually vascular dementia and Parkinson's disease. And that was actually surprising. You know, we see this increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, but it's not at least to the same degree. Um, and then... Of course, we're all familiar with you know, this idea of long COVID and particularly its effects on the brain. So I think the idea of infection influencing the brain has always been at least to some, you know, an obvious sort of clear thing that, that happens, but particularly those who work with, you know, folks who have been critically ill or been hospitalized with infection. You know, people experience long-term cognitive symptoms. You know, sometimes they eventually abate, sometimes, you know, they don't. So this has always been an issue, but I think it really came to the forefront with COVID because obviously you know, it was talked about every day. And um, I think some good research came out of it. Some of this may be specific to COVID, but I think a lot of it is not specific to COVID. I think a lot of it's just, hey, this is what happens when you expose the body to a severe infection. And I, most of this is rele relevant to severe infections, infection of, of course, hospitalization. I don't want people to take away that every time they get a cold, you know, it's going to have a deleterious effect on their brain. That's not the case at all. We're talking about more severe infections. With that said, this study that was published in Nature uh, 2022 did find that, you know, in people infected with COVID versus those without, this is a really well done study, is longitudinal. Um, they found this increase in volume loss across one to two years of people with the, you know, who had COVID infection. Now, when they compared those with COVID infection, were hospitalized versus non-hospitalized, the hospitalized group had a much larger uh, decrement in, in brain volume across this one to two year period. And this was amplified in those who were older. So when this happened among 50 or year olds or younger, there wasn't a whole lot of difference, um, at least in the parapocampal gyrus here. But yeah, as, as it happened in elderly individuals, you know, the difference became more uh, accentuated so another case series, this was done early in, in the pandemic, but I think it was really informative. The, this case series found, and again, this is people who um, had SARS-CoV-2 infection, but also had some neurologic sequelae. But what they did was they took lumbar punctures to get cerebral spinal fluid, and then they took blood concurrently and did a number of assays. So some things that stand out, and this is from blood, was that the C-reactive protein level and these people was, was very high. So if you think of CRP, CRP this is non-specific marker of inflammation. You know, when we think about low-grade chronic inflammation, three, three is the level that people often use. So we're seeing, you know, everybody have a CRP of over a hundred. So it's like many, many times higher than you know, what you might expect, even for low-grade inflammation. So strong peripheral inflammatory response. Um, at the same time, these individuals, because they had CSF, they were able to look at like the white blood cell count in the brain to see if like any of the, there was evidence for viral infection within the CNS. They did not find any. Um, but when they looked at inflammatory proteins in cerebral spinal fluid, there was clear evidence of a, immune activation. So, and this has been borne out in larger studies, but it seems like for most people, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't get into the brain, but the brain is still affected, you know, as we see here with these, you know, indicators of immune activation in CSF and, you know, as, as experienced by people, you know, with long COVID 
and neurologic symptoms. So the idea is that, okay, it's the peripheral immune activation that may influence brain function and not necessarily the virus getting into the brain. And I think that's consistent with how the field has been thinking about how, you know, severe pneumonia or sepsis or, you know, these other critical illnesses influence brain function long-term. So we we set out to identify some of the molecular mediators here. What What is it that occurs in between this infection and uh, cognitive decline and dementia risk that, you know, what are the molecules, what are the pathways that are implicated? Is anything targetable? Like what's happening? So we, we tried to address this using our you know, same proteomic approach with this framework that infection leads to abnormal immune protein expression, and then conduits, molecular changes, energy generation. You know the story by now. And so this was published recently in Nature Aging, but we first demonstrated that infections were associated with neurodegeneration. You know, we looked, you know, at infection history and brain volume loss, so longitudinal uh, brain atrophy in individuals in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. So we started with a broad list of, of infections. You know, this is, all this was done pre-COVID, um, well, at least the infections were measured pre-COVID, so that, that wasn't on the list. We looked at this list of infections and found a number of them yeah, a number of them were associated with brain volume loss. This is influenza and skin and subcutaneous infections, you know, just as examples. But you see here, you know, the general trend for volume loss, and this is the annual change in brain volume across various regions. But this was this was generalized to a number of other peripheral infections as well. Some chronic like HHV, some acute, you know, like the flu. But yeah, here we have a, a pretty consistent trend. Um, so we looked at these six infections in particular because at least in our cohort, they seem to be relevant to brain atrophy. And we then we then asked, okay, do these same infections, if we take the same classification scheme to the UK Biobank and a, a, a Finnish cohort, do we still see that there's, they show an association with dementia? So, you know, an outcome that should be converged essentially with brain atrophy. And, you know, suffice to say that we did see evidence for this for most of our infections. You know, having a history of the flu, for example, is associated with all-cause dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, these are, again, these are hospitalized and, well, these infections captured in ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. So presumably, you know, you can think of these as the more severe end of, of the infection range. And, and the time frame here was out like, up to 16 years. And we did some sensitivity analysis where we looked at, okay, let's take away if we don't consider dementia within a year after infection or within five years or 10 years after infection, do we still see an effect? And the effect persisted, you know, for the most part. And this is addressing this reverse causation issue, which I think is particularly relevant here. Um, in the Finnish multi-cohort, we saw support. This is a smaller sample. And it wasn't as robust, but you know, we still saw these infections being associated with dementia risk. So we then wanted to identify for these six infections, the proteomic signature. Like, how are these infections influencing the proteome? And we did that using the same SomaScan platform. Here we used the 7,000, you know, the updated 7,000K version. We identified 900 immune proteins on that platform and looked at those 900 immune proteins specifically. And we saw that people with a history of the flu, with a history of a skin and subcutaneous infections, and this was the same for the other four, had a proteomic signature, and that was fairly robust. And you know, so we did this for each of them, found the each of the infections, found the proteins associated with infection history, and you know, this is sort of the volcano plot for each of the infections. We found a subset of proteins that were at least implicated across multiple infections, but there was a lot of heterogeneity. I thought we see a lot of the same proteins coming up, but there was quite a quite a few differences. Uh, but certainly some commonalities. And, you know, one thing to note is that this is like history. Well, you know, some of these infections are very remote. You know, this could be you had the flu 10 years ago or you had the flu last year. It doesn't necessarily have to be, okay, what's your proteum look like right after, you know, you, you finished or during influenza infection. So this is really a remote history, I would say, on average. But we took these infection-related proteins, and then we related them back to 
uh, the molecular changes and neurodegeneration. You know, and these to identify our candidate proteins. So we really were after the proteins that mediate this relationship. And and that's sort of yeah, that's what we did here. And this is just another example using influenza. But we have a set of proteins that are in this top uh, left quadrant that are increased after infection and associated with subsequent volume loss in the in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. And we have a set of proteins in the bottom right quadrant that are, uh, let's say, downregulated post-infection and associated with preserved brain volume. Okay, so up, upper left pathogenic quadrant, bottom right protective quadrant, and you see protective and pathogenic here. Everything in red are the influenza-associated proteins. And you can see a lot, for a lot of our, prote our protective proteins, you know, we see support for their association with lower P tau and higher A beta 42 to 40, which is consistent with less Alzheimer's pathology on, on both ends. Uh, a beta is reversed in terms of directionality. Uh, pathogenic, it's less clear. Like, you know, we don't see strong associations with our AD biomarkers for our pathogenic proteins. So, you know, skin infection, we have less proteins overall, but a few candidates in pathogenic and protective. I'm just skip through this so we get to questions. Um, one of, so when we had our, our candidate proteins, we did that for each of our six. You know, proteins that were increased or decreased post-infection and associated with atrophy in the same brain regions that the infection was associated with. We, we performed our two-sample Mendelian randomization to see if there was causal evidence, at least from a genetic perspective, linking these proteins with brain atrophy. And for a subset of proteins, we did see support, and particularly for, I'll point out these skin and subcutaneous and influenza proteins, um, you know, that were, you know, three of them, everything that sort of fell in that category, you know, was supported causally in this Mendelian randomization approach. So all in all, what we had were, you know, subset of proteins that we think are intermediaries between infection history and neurodegeneration and subsequent dementia. Uh, we found more, we had more traction on our protective proteins where these things are downregulated post-infection. And, you know, the, the downregulation seems to be associated with higher amyloid and higher P-tau. Now, you know, that may be the pathway through which these proteins influence atrophy, influence dementia risk, or there may be independent pathways we don't know. For pathogenic proteins, while they were associated with brain atrophy, um, we didn't see strong links between these pathogenic proteins and amyloid and P-tau. So we're still trying to figure out what, okay, what's the, is there an intermediary or are these proteins directly linked to atrophy and dementia? Um, and then a subset of them where we're, of course, mechanistically linked with our Mendelian randomization, which would be, I think, the highly, most highly prioritized candidates in terms of eating intermediaries. So sort of ending where we started, you know, we really think that this infection history you know, influences the proteome that can then influence dementia risk. But there's an alternative hypothesis that I'll just leave you with. You know, we also think it's possible that there's people with a propensity for infection, you know, based on an underlying immune trait that also makes them vulnerable to dementia risk. And we think the in, immune proteins that we see or the lack thereof might be an indicator of this. And so there might be this sort of, tra this trait hypothesis, we'll call it, where okay, you, you have, you're this sort of immune phenotype that makes you susceptible to post infection and dementia. And you know, we're seeing some indication of this based on the, the proteomic signature. So I think that's the competing hypothesis and I think, it, I think it's just as likely. So I'll end there um, and thanks everyone for listening. And uh, before I take questions, I definitely wanna acknowledge my lab at NIA and the funding, all our collaborators at the ERIC study and then the folks at Somalogic that have you know, made a lot of this possible in my funding. So yeah, thank you. Hopefully we have time for questions. Yes, Dr. Cronson, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Walker. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I was particularly intrigued by the one study that you showed where uh, CRP levels were elevated and were very important. And uh, the, 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 the question I want to ask you is a fairly broad one. As bad as COVID was, we did learn a great deal of COVID. And one of the things we learned was 
that if we intervene with COVID at exactly the right time by trying to decrease the inflammatory response by giving tocilizumab to decrease IL-6 levels, Mm -hmm. that actually patients do a lot better. So the question I want to ask you is, do you think we will get to the point at some point in time where we look at uh, these inflammatory markers, uh, uh, both CRP and some of the inflammatory uh, pr- uh, proteins you're talking about, and and start uh, maybe treating people in middle age uh, after they get a severe infection if their inflammatory markers stay elevated and try to decrease the inflammatory process in order to prevent not only dementia, but some of the other chronic diseases that we know are related to inflammation like diabetes. Yeah. So I, I think it is important. It's, it's a really, it's a really good question. I think it is important to identify like what differentiates those people who have an infection or some acute inflammatory injury and like have persistent elevation in these inflammatory proteins versus those who have like this resolution. And I think, you know, if, if you can identify those two groups, you know, th- and those who don't have this resolution of inflammation are going to be at increased risk for, you know, s- subsequent conditions. And I think those, if, if there is a chance to intervene by sort of helping them resolve their inflammatory response in a healthy way, you know, I think it, there may be an avenue to do so and reduce risk for subsequent disease. Now, of course, you got to weigh that against the idea of like making these people perhaps susceptible to future infections by sort of, you know, reducing their inflammatory response or their innate immune response too much. And so I think it, you know, it's it's a fine line, but there are therapeutics out there that, for example, will get rid of soluble TNF while maintaining membrane-bound TNF in a way that is thought to not leave people susceptible to infection, yeah. but, you know, but also remove the, the really harmful pro-inflammatory proteins. Um, but I, and I would be an advocate of like for those at risk for dementia who are pro, like, I think some of like pro-inflammatory signaling is going to be a risk factor for some, but certainly not all. So I think there's a case to, to be made for identifying the a pro-inflammatory phenotype you know, maybe not just for dementia, but in other conditions and saying, okay, you fit this phenotype, you're at risk for this outcome. Let's see if we can, you know, treat the, treat you by, with some immunomodulatory and reduce risk for said outcome. But I, I don't think it should be applied broadly, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, actually, you obviously have to uh, resort to proper timing here because uh, in in an acute infection, obviously the the inflammatory response is absolutely critical in handling right. the acute infection. So it has to be timed properly. Exactly. Okay, we are going to stop questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Walker, for joining us this morning.